Welcome to the spectacular medieval Chateau de Rosières in the beautiful Ardèche region of France. Today, we're not only going to be exploring inside the castle itself, we're also going to be seeing how this estate dates back over 3,000 years and we'll meet the owners who are bringing it back to life. Many of you may recognise Mark and Amy from British TV or from their YouTube channel, The Great Chateau Restoration Project. We were staying here last night and just woke up in the most beautiful bedroom and I cannot wait to show it to you later. It is spectacular. Yeah, well, we ordered you some nice weather, um, so we thought we might start outside, didn't we? That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we brought you down to the garden here because yes. this really shows you what an outcrop we're on. This was a primarily defensive location and it was chosen because the outcrop is a natural defence that goes out into the valley so you can see the marauding troops coming up either yes, valley. from miles. It was the heart of the religious wars around here. So this place has seen quite a bit of action. So this was <laughs> Protestant Catholic fighting. Yes. And before that it was French-English fighting during the hundred years. Hundred years war. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's only now that the region's getting a bit of a break. Yeah. And that they will allow an English Protestant into the chateau. <laughs> Don't worry, it's <laughs> Tolerate, yeah. <laughs> One of the things we love the most here is all the different periods that are cramming into each other and that we try, have to try and unpick. So we've got this several thousand year old history, but the main chateau itself we know dates from at least the 15th century and that we have records of a chateau before that from 1301 is the earliest date that we have. We've got these beautiful oaks that go around the edge of the earthwork and then we have these much later terraces where they try to reclaim control of the gardens and actually use it for uh, beauty but also for practicality because on a slope you can't actually grow anything. These date from around we think probably the 19th century and they also hide some interesting secrets. To uncover more about this secret we have to take you onto the lower terrace. Ooh. I had a visit from somebody um, uh, who lived here in the 1940s and he told us about this terrace. So one thing Mark has always wondered about is some of the jumble of rocks yes. here in this terrace and he always said to me that he thought there was something else going on here. Really? Can you see anywhere that looks like it's been messed with? <laughs> what I'm guessing and I could be wrong is this bit, because it looks like the start of an arch. Is there an ending of the arch? Oh yes, there. Right. But there's a whole arch, yes. Yeah. So there was a, a buried orangery here. Oh. I know. That person told us he remembered several arches along this terrace. And my guess is that there were three of them because the wall has the three parts where it's grouted with cement. There would have been a place where they overwintered the plants and things like that with the sunlight. Imagine with this beautiful sunlight coming in. One of the things I was wondering is that on old postcards of the house, you see they had big pots of oleanders right at the front. Yes. And they were obviously really, really big. And oleanders are not hardy in the area. No. So I had always been wondering where, yeah, where they, they kept them, them yeah. in winter. And now you know. And now we know. <laughs> so down okay? here, we're going to go and see more of the estate. So that's the remains of the old wall that surrounded the whole estate, maybe six or seven meters tall. It must have been so spectacular. It would have been incredible. The Gauls 2000 years ago were uh, really keen on big earthwork, mm -hmm. and the, but they would have wooden buildings on top of it. These buildings would be long gone, but all the stonework remain. So we could be looking at the remains of a 3000 year old wall here. Yeah, possibly two or three thousand, yeah an impressive amount of stones when you yeah. you consider they had to carry them all by hand. Oh, they have been a uh, wild boar here. Oh, is that wild boar? Yeah, they like uh, churning up. Uh, it's okay as long as they don't go in the vegetable garden. It really is a wondrous land with all of these moss-covered ancient stones and the views and the valley in the distance. Most of the oaks that are planted along the wall were probably planted at the same time as the world was built. What we see is the offsprings of the original one. But actually, the size of the stump, this is only one oak that used to have several trunks, but one original oak. The area is really, really dry, and an oak like that grows very slowly. So this one is probably uh, many hundred years old. And they're still alive today. Mm. 
And to think that we're walking in the footsteps of people who've been here for well, millennia. And these are actually all the uh, path I uncovered since we've arrived. They were completely covered in trees and brambles. But Mark worked out that there would always have been a path here because it is exactly in between the wall here and a smaller wall leading to the next terrace. So this was always a path bordered with oaks. It's quite likely that no one used this path for uh, over a hundred years. That is some way to make an entrance. I have to say that suits you. <laughs> well, with 130 acres and a limited amount of time to get you around, I thought this might help. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> in the 1960s, the entire estate was planted in Douglas fir and they wrecked the old terraces yes. and the whole thing was just this big, black, dark, somber yes. mess. And what we're trying to do is encourage yes. biodiversity, different growth, and create some different spaces. And so I'm going to take you now to what we call the sunken garden, which oh. are going to be planted as a subtropical uh, formal gardens. We're subtropical formal gardens? Yep. We're very, very excited about this. I'm loving this. I wish so I had I'm one of these at home. So that's a really sheltered area because it's walled on three sides, which means we don't get any wind and so it never gets really, really cold. We also have a spring in this garden, which means that we'll be able to water it. So what sort of plants? I'm quite interested in the flora of Japan and uh, Eastern China because they are really interesting plants that you don't see very often. And in that you're and absolutely working in the tradition because these big houses and the chateaus, stately homes of England, they always imported plants, don't yes, they? Yes, yeah. I'm really fascinated by the plant hunting uh, time period from the yes. 18th century when uh, people would visit places, discover new places and bring back plants from their travels. Mm. And it's really what I'd like to recreate here. To put this in perspective, our honeymoon was decided on where the weirdest plants were. Four and a half thousand? No, five thousand. Five thousand metre yeah. mountain, bigger than Mont Blanc, with no training. On your honeymoon? Six days through bogs. Um, but there was quite, it was quite cool. Um, it was I was really snow cool. blinded but, and all sorts and yeah. nearly broke my ankle. Um, but apart from <laughs> but that, you had a great so time. Fine. I did. And then afterwards we went to this luxury lodge as a kind of uh, salve to me. And But I couldn't actually have a bar because the bath is full of all his plant samples. <laughs> <laughs> this is the alleyway that was put in in the 19th century and uh, what I'm going to do is take you down to the old entrance to the chateau. And how old is the old entrance? Probably the original one so we're talking about could have been from medieval times but for sure we know that um, it was around in the 17th 16th century. They would have come up here and then a straight ahead is the coach house so I might take you straight to the coach house to see because this is our big renovation project. Here you are arriving in your chariot and this is the start of our retreat centre that we're building and this will be the main area where people can have their food and cook and eat and there's some accommodation at the top. Yeah, we're quite proud of it because it was completely derelict when we first moved in here. Let's go and have a look inside. Yay! When we arrived, this was completely derelict. So there were walls on the outside, but the ceiling had fallen in and mm. uh, there were no windows. It was a real, real mess. And it's the first place that we really tackled in the restoration. I love the doors. They're quite good. We had them made locally. Uh, so they're made with chestnut wood, which is the big wood uh, of the area. Mm. All our philosophy on the restoration work is to use local materials and traditional techniques. It's currently used to store a lot of stuff. So excuse the mess. The key thing here is it fits in with our sustainability idea, uh, self-sustainability. So these are our trees on the ceiling. And the Tomet tiles that we got are from Burgundy, so it's not that far from here. We had local stonemasons, so they know the local techniques about how to manage the stones. We kept quite a lot of the old features because it was the coach house. We found an old forge in the corner. So is this where they would have done all of the repairs for the coaches themselves, but also for the shoes of the horses? The reason we think that is because there was lots of um, charcoal in the area around here and there were also bits of metal everywhere, so sh uh, horse shoes and, and nails and things like that. We can't know for sure. I'm sure they wouldn't have had a full-time farrier, but um, yeah, for sure they used this to do some of the metal work. It's great that you're keeping everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I really, really do love the fact that you've used your trees. They're great. And yeah. so visibly as well. Yeah, leaving the bark on. Now we're going to go up the external staircase of the coach house to see what you've done upstairs. Yes. 
We're accompanied by quite a lot of animals on our way today. <laughs> we're, we're well accompanied. <laughs> oh, this is lovely. Isn't it nice? And this was completely fallen in. We divided it up into just two rooms with yes. ensuite bathrooms, which will be part of the retreat center eventually. But for the moment, this is where we're hoping to live sooner rather than later. The thing holding most of it up at the moment is me making the tiles for the bathrooms. You're making them yourself? Yes. This is where I'm making a splashback for. As you can see, I've been sketching on the wall. It's so lovely, you're putting your own stamp on the place. Yeah, we really want to do things that tie in with the history of the place, but also come very much from us. All along this side, there are some really interesting features that were probably used for the stable boy or somebody who worked here. There's a fireplace, and then beside it, there are these three little trays with holes in the bottom, and they would have been used to put embers in from the fire and then cook the food, and then the cooled embers fall in the bottom, get scooped out, chucked out the window or put outside. And then beside it is this little stone sink, which just would have gone straight to the outside and then the cupboard. So this was probably uh, somebody's mini kitchen in the past. And we decided to keep all those features and uh, make them a part of the future as well. It's actually quite advanced for yeah. its day. Yeah. And in the 19th century, this would have been luxury. Yeah. Next stop on the tour, I'm going to send you up with Mark in the Ranger Ooh. to see the top of the estate, uh, the old Gaul platforms uh, from thousands of years ago, and some of our big sustainability projects and our wine project. Oh, I love it. And I love going in the Ranger. I'll go anywhere. <laughs> in the so this is what suggests that the estates have been lived in for several thousands of years. Yes. We don't know exactly what it is. It is a kind of oval shaped platform with big stones on the edge, smaller stones in the middle, a hole in the middle and some kind of lines of standing stones around it. How mysterious! It feels almost ritualistic. It could be a burial site, it could be an astronomic observatory or something, because yes. we're right at the top of the ridge. One thought is that if you put a big stake in the middle, you might be able to line the shadow with the, some of the stones around. We don't know how old it is. It's probably at the earliest 2,000 years old. Uh, so that's the youngest? <laughs> yeah, the youngest. Okay. Maybe uh, 30 or 40,000 years old. It as feels well. to me, I have to say, it feels older than 2,000 years old. Yeah, it could well be. This feels almost more symbolic than architectural. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, you would be thinking, expecting maybe more architecture. This this feels different. Well, you don't know really, because it could be a base for a wooden building. Yes. At the top, it wouldn't be there anymore. It is really mysterious. Thank you. And there is this oh, hole in the middle. It feels like a fire pit. Could well be. It could be a, a signal platform or something like that. I'm blown away by this. We've visited so many chateaus and we've never seen such an ancient mystery in any of them. This, I'm sure, is the oldest. We've had a team of archaeology students with their professors mm. coming here, but their professors were medievists. They said it was too ancient yeah, for them. This is not their so speciality. They didn't know, yeah. And then there are holes all the way around <gasps> the platform. My goodness. So that's completely hollow. Why? Why did they build it in that way? And there's another one here. Yeah, it seems to be straight in. One other things, thing I can't explain is this yellow deposit here on the stones. It looks like sulfur to me. There shouldn't be that much sulfur in granite. Mystery upon mystery. Yeah. If any of you have any ideas, then please let us know in the comments below because really this is a mystery that still needs to be solved. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night living here, like wanting to solve the mystery. I would love to. Huge! Yeah. So this is a cistern? Yeah, so that's probably 19th century. It really? was Yeah, it was completely overgrown when we arrived. It yes. was, there were trees growing on top of the, the vault. We dug it out, I did some leveling around and we had it replastered with lime. The spring is about 300 meters from here. Uphill, yeah. I guess, and it's yeah. just coming yeah. straight down to this. Yeah, by gravity. The pipe had been broken somewhere uh, because mm. it crosses the road 
And as it had been lost, we had to put a new pipe all the way. So frustrating. Uh, yeah. So now we are uh, self-sufficient with water oh, and we're able to water so our garden. From here, it's gravity fed straight down to yeah, the chateau. Yeah, the chateau is just under here. You must have great water pressure on it because that's quite a slope uh, going down I'll show here. you. You can see it's quite deep as well. It's huge. It's empty at the moment. I wanted to clean it. I'm going to open the tap to show you the water we have. <laughs> you are so, so lucky. We have nothing but trouble with our garden water and the water pressure. I am really proud actually because the it was all our work. <laughs> it had been uh, completely abandoned. Well done. It's a huge <laughs> achievement. And from here you can see just how great the drop is. So the water pressure is huge by the time it gets to the gardens. And what a spectacular view of the chateau. Now we are going to see one of our latest projects, terraces we just cleared to plant some vineyard in the springtime. Do vines grow well here? Yes, actually I have records that uh, vines were already planted on the estate in the 9th century. 9th century? Yeah. All the valley used to belong to monks at the Abbey of Saint Bernard in Romont. In their records, they're talking about vineyards being planted down the Valley de la Daronne, which is this one. It may have taken a thousand years, but finally vines are returning to the valley. Exactly. I know, I know it's possible to grow vines, so, uh, and I like wine. So. <laughs> one of my great-great-great-grandmothers set up a wine business in Champagne in 1808. And this wine business has been in the family since then. It's really a family thing. So now we need to have a big bonfire to burn the stumps and hopefully we'll be planting in the spring. Do you suppose that a wonderful view makes a wine taste more delicious? I'm sure it does. <laughs> yeah, I'm certain of it. Especially when you come up here and drink the wine that you've produced from the vines from this soil. That's the best. How much wine should you be able to produce from these two terraces? 6,000 bottles or something like that. Do you think that'll be just about enough for your mm, public consumption? No, a bit tight. Let's go and have a look around the house. Ah, uh, the moment everyone's been waiting for. The staircase. Oh, hello, Clément. <laughs> and hello, Juliette. Hey, baby pie. Oh, you've got a car to show everybody, have you? That is an excellent car. <laughs> I'm going to show you the Grand Salon. Oh, what a huge room! Filled with beautiful things. It's a bit sort of antique junk at the moment, as in it's all just a big jumble of treasures we've found or things we've had in our lives in here. It's the place that we store all our favourite antiques that we've bought and the bargains we found and the things we both had before we were married. We know that it was closed off for most of the last century and possibly even earlier. Nobody used it because it was just the big grand room. What a shame. I know, and we really want it. That's part of our philosophy is to bring back every corner of the chateau to life. And so the children play on the floor in here. She's already ready to get down with her car, <laughs> I believe, and start playing. We try and play the piano with the kids in the evenings. And the best thing about it is the evening sun comes into here. So it's a really beautiful place to sit in the early evening. It is so idyllic. I'm sure so many people around the world will be watching this. Just thinking this huge chateau, children able to run around everywhere, explore the place, grow up with all this history and nature. It's amazing what you're doing. Thank you. It's a bit of a balancing act because children also like to play with delicate antiques. Yeah. And that can <laughs> end in disaster sometimes, but we just let, we also like the juxtaposition of antiques and Lego. It is good, actually. It's lucky because you definitely have that. What are some of your favourite pieces in here? I would say, weirdly, Mark will massively disagree with me, but this bureau is an Art Deco one. We got it as a set with a table and it was at an auction in Lyon. Nobody wanted it. And we think we got the entire set for 150 euros. Because it, was, it wasn't fashionable. And it's got this most beautiful marquetry mm. and it's just a real statement piece. The fun here is finding pieces that you couldn't put anywhere else, like in our little apartments we had before, or the house we lived in before this was a tiny wooden house in a jungle. In the West Indies, the whole house was smaller than this room, 
And so we've gone from that to this, and we really like to celebrate that with massive pieces of furniture yeah, that nobody absolutely. else wants. But in fact, there's quite a link. It means that you're really good at choosing the best places to live. <laughs> I know. It sounds amazing. Yeah, it was pretty good. And we did sort of live outside a lot there, which is, I think, why the outdoors is always attractive yeah. us to here. But in terms of ma now managing to buy huge pieces yeah. of furniture and yeah. objects, can you tell us more about the painting? Because <laughs> that would not fit in a flat. No, exactly. One of the massive tricks was trying to hang that thing. I actually insisted that we had an inflatable bed underneath it for the first two months. That just we had to be hanging because I did not trust the hanging. Every year, this auction house in Lyon, which is quite close to the Alps, do a, a fabulous mountain sale and they have paintings and artifacts from the Alps. We just loved it. It's we, perfect here. The major puzzle, and I don't know if you or anybody watching can help us, is we can't work out which mountain it is. Whereas we've got other mountain pictures in the chateau mm. and we've gone and we found where they are and we've stood where they actually were, t were painted. Yes. But this one, it's a real mystery. So if any of you think you know, <laughs> then please let us know in the comments. Do you recognise this mountain? <laughs> I definitely don't. I'm going to be honest. I'm not a skier. I hate skiing because mm. it's too fast. But I love just sitting in mountains and looking at them and being in the snow and stuff. So that brings that part of our lives into the chateau. I like the fondue and the hot wine. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> I think we definitely have the same approach. <laughs> right, we're going to take you now through to the dining room. This room is the party piece room of the chateau at the moment. We've done the most work in here, I'd say. It's not used in winter because it's very very cold no radiators and single glazing lots of windows beautifully bright for the moment i use it as a sort of workstation for my tile project that i was telling you about this is a splashback i think they're absolutely stunning do you like them absolutely love them and that glaze is so lustrous yeah it's a nice one isn't it for a first go i think it's not too bad I've been doing a whole load of videos about this, but I was quite happy with these, you know, these handmade ones and the glaze on it. I love the uneven handmade quality. Yeah, that's definitely what I was going for. Wait, <laughs> but it makes it so much more precious. <laughs> yeah, it's a big success. Thank you. This really big piece of furniture is a Swiss dresser that I found at an auction in Normandy. When do you think it dates from? Late 16th century or early 17th. It is probably mostly from that time period, but it might have been changed a little bit. It is a really stunning piece of furniture, in my opinion. It was really meant to be in a dining room like this one, because it has this little fountain, it's a tin fountain. And the idea is that you would come in through the door, wash your hands before uh, going for dinner, and then help yourself with the food that would be on display on the dresser. It's so ingenious. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. I, I think very few people have seen anything like <laughs> it. What I find really interesting is the marquetry work on it, because it's not painted or anything. It's all inlaid little pieces of wood. Oh, the work. A lot of different woods. And the color gradient was made by dipping the piece of wood into hot sand so that it would burn uh, one side. They would manage to do very subtle uh, nuances of wood. And so they burnt the edges to make them look like bricks. So clever. But your whole chateau is filled with fascinating things. Uh, if we had time, we could spend a whole video on each room here, just the objects inside. And this is a perfect example of that. If you ignore the junk in here, you can see the most amazing fireplace that we uncovered. I can't get over the size of it. Well, it's incredible. And when we moved in here, it actually only went up to just behind these uh, windows and the height, current height there. We had no idea what was behind it. And there was a modern insert and it wasn't working terribly well and we weren't sure about it. And then one day there was a bird stuck in the pipe and that was it. So we decided to destroy it and rescue the bird. Uh, which was a baby kestrel actually when we hacked it away we found the original fireplace mm -hmm. and an old bread oven and what was really puzzling us was the fireplace started stopped around here um, sort of nearly knee height and the bread oven was really high up what's that all about and what we've always noticed in here is the flowing of the bedrock through the room so it comes really far into it it feels really strange you've almost got the mountain in the chateau that's and, extraordinary. Isn't it? Uh, yeah, that is the bedrock. That's actually bedrock. Yep, yep. It's not a stone. 
And what we realised was that they had lowered the floor in this room to make it look grander in the 19th century, the Gothic arch over there, and they wanted big windows and it no longer needed to be a defensive fortress. So they just wanted to make it beautiful. So they lowered the floor in here. And so this was a pretty ingenious way and yeah. fairly hardcore <laughs> way that they decided to go into the bedroom. But it is ingenious. Yeah. But what we did in our restoration of it was to have the stonemason carve an identical piece of stone there so it looks like the fireplace continues down to the floor. As though it's always been there. Yeah. This is only the first big discovery that we made here. And uh, to show you more about what we've been looking at, I'll take you through to the cellars. This is one of the big mysteries of the chateau. It's a staircase that's inside the wall. So in the, it was built in the thickness of the wall and it's been walled for at least one century, probably more. Can I have a look? Let's see how far I can go. It is probably 15th century. So this dates from the 1400s and just stops here. What is behind you? We don't know because there's a wall and we can't go past it. So one day we will reel and see what's behind. You have to find out what if the yeah. treasure is there. I really can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the only secret of this part of the house because we recently learned that there are cellars underneath. We started investigating about that uh, recently in one of our latest videos. So if any of you want to find out more about the hidden cellars, then go over to Mark and Amy's channel, The Great Chateau Restoration Project. Before we go, I do have one request. Yes. Could you show everybody the absolutely stunning bedroom that Philip and I stayed in last night? With pleasure. On our way to the most beautiful bedroom imaginable, Mark has offered to show us one of the ancient documents of the chateau. So these are very ancient manuscripts that we were lucky to, to find. They're written in Latin on vellum, which is the uh, animal skins. This one, for instance, is dated uh, 1477. And this is the will of the owner of the chateau, the lord of the chateau at the time. His name was Dragonet de Burin, and he's probably the one who rebuilt the chateau after the Hundred Years' War, as it is now. And it's a very emotional document because he leaves uh, money for his daughter to marry. Uh, he leaves his uh, grey fur coat to the priest in Saint Felicien. Oh, um, little personal yeah. touches. Yeah, really, really, really emotional. I have done my best to tidy, but obviously we were staying in this room last night. Is it the most beautiful room imaginable? We decided to decorate this room first. Uh, it was the most beautiful room in the chateau, most beautiful bedroom anyway. The light streams in, you can see the Alps and the mountains of the massive Centrale. And the only problem we had was the walls were very tired 70s faded wallpaper. And we decided to do something very special in here and put fabric back on the walls, which would have been a traditional wall covering. It mutes the sound a little bit, so it stops it sounding too cold and echoey. And it's very traditional. But we put our own twist on it and we commissioned a lady who does chinoiserie wallpapers to paint our fabrics with reference to our lives in here. So it became our room and it's very special to us. And so we have panels along the back which represent elements of our life here in Rosière. We have panels on the sides which represent our lives in the Caribbean. Uh, Mark insisted on them being very specific birds in there that we'd seen. And then we have panels on this side, which represent our incredible, terrifying honeymoon in the Ruanzori Mountains of Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we sleep in here, which actually isn't very often these days, but we wake up and see these views from our life and it's beautiful and bright and the children love it. I can't describe how much I loved it. I think it's one of the most beautiful and touching wall decorations that I've ever seen in a bedroom because it's so personal and symbolic for you. That's really kind of you to say so. I mean, it's obviously not fitted properly yet. We had some issues with the fabric uh, creasing, but we put them up just to see if they would look good and they do. So we've just got to finish that bit of it.
We're going to move on to the top floor long term. This will be the luxury uh, bed and breakfast room that we rent out from time to time. Well, I have to tell you that you might have some difficulty shifting us from this room once you open the B&B because we just love it so much. And the whole chateau is spectacular, filled with history and nature in a way that we haven't seen in many of the other chateaus we've visited because you have such a huge estate with these spectacular views and history going back 3,000 years. That is very very special so thank you so much for showing us around oh it's been really glorious having you here it's so nice to have such positive people coming and people who understand our project and appreciate it we know what we're going through <laughs> yeah, but you're coming to la lansing i really hope so yeah. excellent look forward to seeing you there <laughs> wonderful